Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord. We've had a wonderful uh, camp meeting, just so powerful and just so much information you're giving us, so much more understanding. You're opening now uh, the door for us to understand um, more on homophobia and it's really, really powerful. And it's just so much more confirmation, Lord, that we so desperately need and um, it's just, uh, it's amazing. And it's, it's, it's perfect timing, just like you do everything. It's always perfect timing. And we thank you. We pray that everyone would uh, review these uh, camp meeting videos. They're just so full of uh, wonderful information. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a blessing. Thank you for your profits that you give us, that you give us this just phenomenal uh, teachers and leaders in this group. I'm so grateful to be a part of this movement. I pray that you would bless everyone in this movement. And I pray these things, give, give uh, a Jackie a special blessing with her uh, study. And we just give you all the glory, Lord. We praise you and honor you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes, so we're ready to begin. Everyone ready? Ready. Good. I'm glad everybody is able to be here tonight, at least those that can be with us. And um, yes, as we're finishing up, uh, I say this because we only have three more studies left of uh, Guadalupe. And this one tonight is number 12. So Israel and Modern Babylon and by Sister Tess, by Elder Tess and um, done in April of 2019. So I just wanted to share a few things. Um, when I'm looking at this date, April 2019, I hadn't even known of this message. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm just, I'm giving God all the glory and thanking him for being with each one of us and, you know, really hearing the call uh, and stepping up and taking up the teaching responsibilities and what a blessing it is. And I know I have so much more to learn, but I know that He's with each one of us and it is a blessing because it's a way of learning even more as we do it, as we rehearse it in our minds and God is leading us then for where we are now, it's, it's connecting dots as I mentioned before and really giving us uh, a clearer picture of the lines and um, how important it is for us to understand this message in this time we live with the light that's coming so rapidly now. So I just wanted to share that. And I want to add something if I can. Sure, go right ahead. You mentioned the date, April 2019, because that's the month that we had the rescue camp meeting where many of us were baptized, which was, um, and so this was taking place at that time, which was the month that Sister Allie and Brother Henry came here. So it means it was the same month that they caught up with you. Yes, exactly. It was the end of April. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yes, when when they um, they arrived in Medford from their long trip from way up in northern BC. And of course, I had no idea that we were that they were even coming, but Long story short, they stopped at uh, my previous business, my husband's and my business, and my younger son owns the business now. And uh, it's been in the same place ever since because Henry was here quite a long time ago and um, he and his family, in fact, and they stayed with us, our, our family. And uh, so when I got the call from my son that Henry, he didn't even tell me who it was, but he just said, there's someone here that 
was a very special friend. And uh, he would like to know if it's all right if he comes out to visit you. And I said, oh, who is it? And he said, he said, well, I'll, yes, I'll tell you, mom. It's, it's Henry and his wife. And I said, oh, what a blessing. And of course he remembered where I lived. So wow. he didn't even need directions. He just knew exactly where my house was. So, and it was, yeah, it was quite a blessing to be able to visit with them and just kind of catch up. In fact, it was a long, <laughs> we had a nice long visit and I knew they were gonna, you know, wanna be get, go get going because they were on their way to California. So, yes, it's uh, how fast things happen, you know, when you look back and see, you know, how God led everything. And definitely the timing was just perfect. Yeah. Because yeah. I was seeking for truth. And yeah. I didn't have a group I was meeting with. And I knew that God had it all in his hands. And as I've shared before, the so much error out there around adventism and the sabbath and flat earth and all this conspiracy stuff and that was one of the first questions i asked uh henry you know and he said well that's he was very mild about it he didn't get ranting on it but he just said well you know it's it's those things out there that you have to be careful of because you know there's not a lot of truth in it and it really doesn't have anything to do with uh, God's truth. <laughs> and I thought that was that was so appropriate, you know. He didn't try to discourage me because, you know, he knew he wasn't quite sure where I was coming from at that time. So he was just very open to my questions and uh, being helpful in whatever way he could be without overpowering me. And yeah, I don't know if they're with us tonight, but I, I'll never forget that because it was, you know, it was their first, my first impression of where they were coming from with the message. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, and it's, that is a reminder to me of how I come across with others, especially my, my family who saw me going in a, different way from what they uh, knew me as coming from. And that was quite an opening to, to them because they were very, very hesitant about where I was going, what direction I was going in. So now my, I, I wanna share this and then we can get right to the study, but I see how God has worked this all along. And my oldest son, uh, who lives next door to me is so into this message. <laughs> he, I mean, he is, he's not doing a lot of studying for himself. He's reading uh, Spirit of Prophecy and um, Desire of Ages and some of Sister White's other books because they were in the church, they were in the Adventist church and also this other group that I was with, they were there too, both my sons. So he is, he comes over every morning now and we visit together about what God is doing, how he's leading, where we are in the world now. And uh, he's, he's learned a lot, just, yeah, he's learning ex external things, but you know, there's truth in there. And uh, I'm very, thankful for this so and I'm sure we all are with our family members and we want them you know very much to accept the truth so well we can begin now if everybody is ready and I hope I didn't go on too long here so we're going to start with the first page, compare and contrast. And uh, if anybody would like to read to, this is um, 51 pages, I believe 51, 52, although there isn't a lot of writing. Um, the lines are 
pay, I'm paying very close attention to these lines because it is a compare and contrast. So it will take us uh, quite a ways here now towards the end of this study, we will uh, see a lot more compared and contrasted with our line where we are today. So, alrighty, so we'll begin. We'll do a review. In our last study, we went to Daniel 1140, based on our understanding of parables. We wanted to see if we could come to the same understanding that we were reaching by studying history. Then we went into the history of Pyrrhus, first Acts 27, and then into Pyrrhus, and saw that there are two parts, an alpha and an, and an omega. We also saw in Daniel 11, with Seleucus and the Ptolemy, that there was the history of Raphia and Panium. Those things helped us to understand that in our history, post 1991, there would be another war between the King of the North and the King of the South. Can everyone see the screen all right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, we can. Good, okay. So uh, two parts to uh, Daniel 4, 1140. Part A and part B, as we can see the two lines. And these lines are going to repeat on uh, the following slides. So we can get a good look at it here right now. I'll just read uh, this paragraph. We went to Daniel 1140 and we did a compare and contrast. We took the history we know well, the French Revolution, the deadly wound in 1798 and the knowledge that it would resurrect. Perhaps we needed reminding that this is also a captivity and that there would also have to be a death and it's preceded by a war. Once we had all these details laid out for the 1798 history, then we were ready to approach part B of verse 40, which is this line here. And we're gonna review this and compare and contrast it. We can see a Cold War that takes us to 1989. Am I on the right page? Yeah, yeah, 1989 up here, deadly wound, Berlin, Berlin Wall Falls in the south. So, and again, we have a story of a deadly wound, but we have all always known that the Soviet Union, USSR, did not end in 1989. Therefore, 1989 is the deadly wound, and its death is in 1991 with the dissolving of the USSR. 1798 is the captivity, and 1799, the death of Pope pious the sixth and then we see mikhail gorbachev whose rulership is irretrievably weakened in 1989 in 1991 the same day he resigns within the same hour half hour the ussr is dissolved We have the story of Pyrrhus, Pyrrhus the sixth, what is that, the one, is that right? We have the story of Pyrrhus, Pius, that's Pius. Pius the sixth, put Pius the sixth. And Gorbachev. So then we can also draw the conclusion that it must resurrect, even though the King of the South died in 1991. We already know we are entering into a time period where there is going to be a war between the King of the North and the King of the South, just as, as we have already understood through the Eastern Front of World War II. 
if we're going to see this as a deadly wound and a death up here, as it was here, he that killed with the sword must also be killed with the sword. Then he that brought God's people into captivity must also go into captivity. And to understand the captivity requires a different compare and contrast. So we have modern Israel, the Alpha, the Omega, modern Babylon coming out, both coming out, Alpha and Omega. So now our parable is between modern Israel and the modern Babylon. What happened to modern Israel when it came out of captivity? will show us what must happen to modern Babylon when it comes out of captivity. Very briefly, we discussed why the papacy went into captivity and began to consider the thought about whether or not Satan's church can be in rebellion to him. If God's church can live outwardly moral lives and yet look, look to God and say, we will not do what you request us to do, like the Pharisees did. And if they choose their own way, then why can't the papal church look to Satan and live moral or immoral lives and say, despite what you have asked us to do, we would rather rest in our own big houses and enjoy our wealth rather than rest, excuse me, uh, instead of entering into hardship and undertake the work you have asked us to do to protect the Jesuits and continue their job function, they would have needed to surrender temporal prosperity. But just like God's people, the papal church decided against doing what they were told to do in 1773, and that's apostasy. If you go into apostasy, sooner or later, you go into captivity, which is why you see the papacy go into captivity in 1798. If they are going to go into captivity, when they come out of captivity, then they come out as modern Babylon. And modern Babylon is going to look like modern Israel. And modern Israel is brought out by a three-step prophetic testing message. Fear God and give glory or give him glory because judgment is coming. We see this in the box, too, because it'll talk more about Fatima and what this means. Any questions or comments? Okay. In 1917, they have a three-step message. Fear Satan. Give him glory, or you're going to be judged. The midpoint, the core message is to defeat the king of the south because it's 1917. Satan can see what is happening. We're on this line right here. Pope Pius and Hitler. So 1917, fear Satan, give, give him glory or you're going to be judged. The midpoint, the core message is to defeat the King of the South because it's 1917. Satan can see what is happening and he needs to get his house in order before they can do a work. We've just 
began to consider what this looked like in 1798 and 1899. Compare and contrast modern Israel and modern Babylon. What we want to do now is compare and contrast modern Israel and modern Babylon. And in doing this, we will not be going into as much detail. We can spend quite a few presentations reading quotes and going into history, but there is a separate purpose to go over this history. It is separate to just understanding the history, but there is a separate missing a line here. It, it is separate to just understanding the counterfeit or as an exercise in parables. And there are a couple of points we need to see. 1798. We're going to take the history of modern Israel and see how well it lines up with the history of modern Babylon to see how closely Satan is counterfeiting. We began to do that work when we discussed 1798. And we said this is when modern Israel becomes visible in history and comes out of captivity. That being so, without trying to prove any of it, we just want to see the history of modern Israel as the movement currently understands it. From 538 AD to 1798, there's a scattering time. It's this time up in the air, scattering. The time of captivity, we're going to call it a scattering. In 1798, God's people come out of captivity. So they enter into a gathering time here. It's a scattering and a gathering in 1798. There's an increase of knowledge. And someone is raised up who is going to become a new leader for God's people. This is William Miller. This gathering time here lasts until 1844, there's a 46 year history of gathering, rebuilding the temple. And it ends in a disappointment, a bitter experience. We're all familiar with this. So we just, dis it is a disappointment, a bitter experience, we discussed that when we looked at Acts 27, God's people were scattered until 1850. And then in 1850, there was a renewed effort at gathering. Does anyone know what's coming after this? The year and a renewed effort at gathering. You may be familiar with the 1850 chart. And that was part of this purpose right in there. It's the year. I'll paraphrase a couple, will paraphrase a couple of quotes. This one is in the Great Controversy, 1888 edition. And will We'll just read the first two sentences. He had devoted two years to the study of the Bible when in 1818, he reached the solemn conviction that in about 25 years, Christ would appear for the redemption of his people. I need not speak, says Miller, of the joy that filled my heart in view of the delightful prospect, nor of the ardent longings of my soul for a part participation in the joys of the redeemed. That's Great Controversy 88, 
What William Miller is saying is that in 1818, he reached the conclusion that Jesus was going to return in about 25 years. So there's an increase of knowledge. And by 1818, Miller has his message. And it's all in a capsule form. There are more details to come, but he understands what is happening. This is a quote from the Review and Herald and Ellen Gould White, E.G. White says that the Lord has shown her that he has stretched out his hand a second time to gather his people. This is towards the end of 1850. September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. In the scattering time, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up his people. In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished but little or nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was a shame for any to refer to the scattering, for examples, to govern us now that in the gathering, where if God does not if God does no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never be gathered. It is as necessary that the truth got a, can't quite read that last sentence. I need to get this out of the way here. Huh. Yeah, I need to bump that up. Not unless somebody else sees it better than I do, they can finish I'll that read, sentence. I'll read that sentence for you. Okay, thank you. I know things get in the way on our with, uh, with Zoom. <laughs> so so yeah. Israel would never be gathered. It is as necessary that the truth should be published in a paper as preached. And that was Ellen G. White Review and Herald, November 1, 1850, paragraph 9. Thank you. Would anybody else like to read? Sure, I can read some. All righty. And it's starting up here. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Do I have one page to go here? All righty. Wait a minute. Okay, go ahead. What she is saying is that God is attempting a second gathering of his people in 1850. And we saw that it is also related to the 1850 chart and the work that they were meant to do. That is when a gathering time began. We noticed that by 1863, something has happened to that message. What has happened? They rejected it. In 1863, there was a couple of issues in the church. There's, there's organization going on. Is that a good or a bad? Is that good or bad? It is good. Not everything in 1863 was negative. But at the same time, they are organizing their work. There is a rejection. Rejection of what? Of their prophetic message. Organization was a good work. It's necessary. Rejecting the prophetic message is suicide for their mission. Let me see here. Can you see that all right, brother? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good.
Okay, you, you can uh, go to the next page there. I don't think we didn't read that page, did we? The one before? I think, no, we didn't. Oh, okay, I, I, I thought it was the same page, but. I'm not. That's all in, right. In 1863, we, we know that, we know they are back in the scattering time. Therefore, when we come to 1888, what is meant to happen? We have a message of A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner coming into the church. And it's Jones and Wagner versus the leadership of G.I. Butler. But you could also include Uriah Smith. There are different leaders opposing Jones and Wagner and Butler and Smith are holding to the traditional view of Adventism. Jones and Wagner are coming with new ideas and it's opposed by the leadership who are supporting the traditional definition of the righteousness by faith. The traditional view is based on a book of Galatians. It will discuss, we will discuss this more 1888 is a failure. Yes, it's it's a failed attempt. Then we come to 1989 from 1863. Even though the history of 1888 is a time of scattering, the 46 years from 1798 to 1844 were the, were the time of gathering. First of all, there is a time of captivity from 538 to 1798. And then they came out with the three angels message. They are entering and they enter a time period of gathering from 17, 1798 to 1844, it ends in a disappointment. We mark 1818 when they had their message collected. 1844, they scattered. In 1850, there's an attempt at a gathering, but it goes nowhere because they are entering into a Laodicean condition. <laughs> From 538 to 1798 is a, is a 1260. It is a scattering. From 1863 to 1989 is a, is a 126 and is a scattering. Until 1989, from 1798 to 1844 is, is the Alpha, and it is the beginning of modern Israel. From 1989 forward, it's an Omega, and, it, and, it, and it's the end of modern Israel. So we are, we are going to compare and contrast what has, what has been happening in the counterfeit since 1798. We are not going to go into all, all the quotes and all the proof, partly because of time and partly because we would read from some books that we don't have with us and partly because we're wanting to make separate, make we were wanting to make a separate point. We're, we're hoping to see the logic and then, then start to consider some, some of the things for ourselves. In 1798, the papacy goes into a scattering time and it begins to regather, it begins its regathering in 
1899. This is the beginning of modern Babylon. 1798 is the rising up of Miller when he buys his concordance and begins to study on prophecy. You got some good charts there, Jackie. I like that. <laughs> yes, I believe it's my sister's. <laughs> She's got some very nice artwork there. <laughs> yeah, I like it. 1899 is the rising up of a different man. This is Eugenio Pacelli. Pacelli comes from the family of the Vatican lawyers extremely dedicated to the papacy. To give a little context, he is the grandson of Marcantonio Pacelli, who became the, prim the primary lawyer for the Pope about 60 years before. I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that's years. So, yes. they have, so they have always had a close interaction with the papacy. His grandfather, Marco Antonio Parcelli, and he has a brother, Francesco Pacelli. So, so there are two brothers, Francesco and Eugenio. They are both trained under a particular cardinal. Cardinal Pas Gaspari. And what this family believes is what many Catholics believe, believed in that time period is that if is that it's a sin that the Catholic Church is being is being treated the way it is. They say they see it is the papacy has lost its worldly power and they live their daily lives to, to prote in protest of what they see, see captivity. There are different ways to do this. They live in poverty, even though they have a wealthy occupation to mirror the conditions of their church. They will leave their door open to their house as, as a witness to to the two people that that the Pope no longer has his own home because those papal states have been taken away. So neither should they. Did that move? Uh, there we go. Oh, okay, just a little delay there. Yeah. They are directly protesting the condition of the papacy. This whole Pacelli family, including the two brother, these two brothers, Vatican lawyers, became involved with Cardinal Gaspari. It's Cardinal Gaspari and Francisco Pacelli who wrote and negotiated the Lateran Treaty. These two men are responsible for the Lateran Treaty with Mussolini. It's Cardinal Gasperi and Eugenio uh, Pacelli who go into an alliance with Hitler in World War II. And Eugenio Pacelli became Pope Pius the 12th, the first Pope to accept the message of Fatima. So these two brothers became extremely important in this history. One is responsible for the Lateran Treaty and, and an alliance with Mussolini that places Mussolini in power. The other one, Eugenio Pacelli, he goes into an alliance with Hitler. 
and allows Hitler to have absolute power. Therefore, you can also see the interaction with the papacy and fascism, which is why they support Germany, Italy with Mussolini and Franco in the civil war we talked about. It's Eugenio Pacelli who became Pope Pius XII, who we want to primarily discuss. Wow, that's interesting. Very good. Yes. Your pronunciation there is beautiful on the names. Uh, <laughs> I'm not Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we got Francisco Francesco Baselli here on the right on the left hand side. The letter and treaty. Oh, this is uh okay. Mm. okay. Um the, the letter and treaty Italian Patty letter Letter Nessi, Latin. Pacta, okay, I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> was one component and uh, com component, component agreement that made up the Lateran Pact of 1929. The agreement made in 1929 between the Kingdom of Italy and the Holy See. Uh, setting the Roman question. The treaty and the associated pact are named after the Lateran the latter Palace, where they are signed on the 11th of February, 1929. The Italian Parliament ratified them on, June, on 7th, June, 1929. The Lateran Treaty recognized Vatican City as an independent state under the sover sovereignty of the Holy See. The Italian government at the time, led by Bonito, Benito Mussolini as prime minister, also agreed to give the, the Roman uh, Catholic Church financial compensation for the loss of the Papal States. In 1947, the Lateran Treaty was recognized in the Constitution of Italy as regulating the relations between the state and the Catholic Church. You want to continue, Frank? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go somewhere. Okay. Good, thank you. Sure. To negotiate this alliance with Hitler, he starts to study church law. First of all, he becomes a priest, and then he becomes and then he begins to study the code of canon law. The canon law that the papacy uses to negotiate in relationship with state governments. April second. 1899, Baselli was ordained a priest. And then in the autumn of, the, of that year, he began at an institute to study canon law. It's in this study, the canon law, that he begins his relationship with Cardinal Gasparri, Gasparri. And he begins to rewrite the canon law and they want to primarily introduce into Germany. All, all of this begins in 1899, when Pacelli begins to study, the, study church law. That church law is, is crucial to the alliance with Germany. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> in uh, 1917, we find the message of Fatima in 19, 1917, 
an impersonation of Mary comes down to the to the to three children, primarily Lucia, and gives her a three-step prophetic testing message. There are a number of visions the children have with Mary. There are six visions. They begin on the 13th of May. On the 13th of May, Mary first appears to, the, to those children. Also on the 13th of May, 1917, that exact same day, Haseli is made an archbishop with the direct purpose of sending him to, to Germany to negotiate to negotiate an alliance with, with the government. As Mary was appearing in Fatima, uh, Pasali was made an archbishop directly with Pope, by Pope De Benedict the, what is that, uh, the 15th? I think it's 15th. 15th. Yeah. By Pope Benedict the 15th with the purpose of sending him to Germany. So the same day, on the 13th of May, you have the beginning of the work of Paselli and the, and the beginning of the visions of Fatima. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. On May 18th, five days later, Paselli goes to Germany also in May 1917, in this same month, the Code of Canon Law is fully published. Consequently, you have Fatima, but you also have church law in the same month. The same year, this is their alliance with Germany and was the work of Paselli. We understand internally that we have the work of the church. We go to the church and then we go to the world. First the church and then the world. And this is the first activity we see of the papacy. Mm -hmm. If they are going to do a work with, with the government in the world, then they first need need control over their own people again. And this was the purpose of the Code of Canon Law. Wow. Those connections. Yeah. All right. So Pacelli goes into an alliance with Hitler and that lasts through the history of World War II. How did that alliance end? It ended in 1945 with a disappointment. Why? Why, why is it a disappointment? He is allied to Hitler to take down the Soviet Union. Hitler lost in 1945. It was a failed attempt. You can see the papacy in, in the scattering time period from 1945 to 1950. Between 1917 through 1945, actually in 1939, Pacelli becomes Pope Pius VII. And he is still pope through the history of, of 1950. In 1950, he, he brings back to public consciousness the message of Fatima. Therefore, from 1945 through 1950, the Catholic Church is in a scattering. They're watching the USSR sweep away Eastern Europe and fall of at um, Eastern Europe, the fall of the Iron Curtain. And they are fighting for Italy to, be, to not become communist as well. And 
it's a dark time. 1950 is a Catholic Jubilee year and Paselli can see they need a revival. As a result, what Paselli introduces in 1950 is the dogma of the Assumption, be, be, uh, bringing Mary back. The formal uh, definition of dogma of the Assumption is what Mary was assumed in body and soul to heaven. That brings back memories. Wow. Because I was a Catholic before I wow. was a seventh day. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of history behind this. Yeah. Catholic Church. A lot of fake history. Yes. When we talk about papal uh, infallibility, does it mean everything that they say or can do be claimed to be infallible? It does mean when they see something they can't prove, they can sign their name to it and say that that as a representative of God, that they are making a formal declaration that they have just written is invaluable. What? <laughs> Man. Just say it is. I don't have any, <laughs> no proof, nothing. Sound like a car salesman. 1950 is the only time that is that it has been used in history. With the dogma of the assumption, what Paselli is trying to do as someone that that is dedicated to the message of Fatima is bring Mary back. And on the bottom of the little picture on the left-hand side, it says, on November 1, 1950, Pius VII defined the dogma of the Assumption. Uh, Titans Asunta, 1516 through 1518 pictured. Hmm. We are reading from a book titled Hitler's Pope, The Secret History of Pope Pius VII. And he, in parentheses, Cornwall, says that the, the timing for the dogma of the assumption was international because Franco in Spain, another fascist, was using Mary and her assumption as the, the reigning cry against communism. In this history of 1950, Paselli claimed to see the same mystical experience, experiences and experiences experienced at Fatima. He says that he actually experienced Fatima in 1950 and all of the signs in heaven they claimed to have then, Paselli's attempt failed. In 1958, this Pope dies and in, and in, comes, and in comes a new Pope, Pope John the 13th. The X's equal 10. I think that's 23rd. Oh, 23rd, yeah. I'm sorry. 23rd. I can't, I can't count. <laughs> I had to look it up. A quick correction, it was Pope Pius the 12th, just for those who are listening on the video. Oh, the 12th. Okay. Thanks. Up above. Oh, okay. Yeah, right up here. John Paul is uh, 23. Okay, got it. Okay. I you thank you for the correction. Sorry. <laughs> You know, it's okay, Sister Christine. <laughs> All right, next page. In uh, 1959, oops. Yep, wait a minute. In 1959, that. that's okay. In 1959, Pope John the 23rd called a council as he wanted to look at the uh, renewal of the Catholic Church. 
and bring back Christianity unity in the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council begins. What is the Second Vatican Council about? The Second Vatican Council in 1962 was a reorganization of the Catholic Church structure. This is what conservative Catholics have warred against ever since. A strong conservative Catholic would say that, that this was of Satan, that their church was in apostasy, and that the leadership was in apostasy. Even the Pope himself, there are tens of thousands of conservative Catholics who say that the Pope today is a representative of the Antichrist because they refer back to the Second Vatican Council and call it apostasy. Well, fighting in the ranks. Oh, yeah. And still doing that even to this day. Yeah. From a Catholic point of view, this call for unity to reorganize their church was not a bad thing. All conservative Catholics wanted to use the Second Vatican Council to condemn modern heresy and new doctrines. But that didn't happen. Instead, the thought that was introduced was that the Catholic Church should develop and change with society and history and experience racial radical re reformation reformation from the view of the counterfeit that was a good thing they needed it this second vatican council took place over a period of time and something else happened in 1962. There was a meeting. What was the purpose of the Catholic Church now? It is not to persecute God's people or control the kings. They were given a job function in 1917. What was the job function? To destroy the king of the south and this is a new pope, John the 23rd. In 1962, he is in the Second Vatican Council, and he wants to encourage unity with the other churches. There is one church that he wants, but he, he doesn't have access to it. And that is the, the Russian Eastern Orthodox Church. And they, they can't come because the US, USSR won't let them. Then in 1962, there was a secret meeting. They met in France. And in this meeting was between representatives of the Soviet Union and representatives of the, of the Catholic Church, especially one cardinal in particular. What, they negotiated was an agreement. This is about the history of Lucia, 1917 through 1962. She is alive until 2005, but, but these Pope were too proud to meet with her and refused to listen to her, particularly the ones that come in in this history from 1950 to 1962, because they rejected the message of Fatima. There was some pretense, but they never lived up to that cause, lived up to that cause. 
You still good to go? Yeah, I'll give it some more. All right. Now, now we have a series of popes all rejecting Fatima until 1989. And then you have a new pope, Pope, um, a new pope, John Paul II. We've discussed this briefly. John Paul II was made pope in 1978. A couple of years later in 1981, there are two assassination attempts on who? One was John Paul II. The other one was on Ronald Reagan. Close together, these two were, uh, these two assassination attempts on their leadership. I just want to note when, when did James White die? 1881. 1881 par parallels 1981. Yeah. 1881 when John Paul, up here. Yeah. James White dies right here. That is very interesting. Yeah. When John Paul II is shot. He almost dies and then when he survives and he he can't communicate the first thing he wants to, is to get access to the written message of Fatima because he was shot on the 13th of May 1981 he isn't entirely sure what this third message meant the first message is fear the second message is the king of the south. The third message is the judgment that will happen if they don't do, if they do not fulfill the second. That was their third message. He, he the three will, messages, yeah. Yeah. That we saw in the beginning. He well knows in this history of the past that they have failed the second king of the south. His church has been in apostasy and he connects the 13th of May in 1917 with the 13th of May in 1981. He believes that this assassination attempt was judgment because he didn't dedicate dedicate Russia, which is which is why from 1981, particularly through the history, John Paul II is is determined to break down the USSR. It's not all about freeing Poland. It's it's a life and death message for the Catholic Church. When we come to the history of 1989, we have discussed this before. It was it successful? Was it success or failure? What did John Paul II want? He wanted more than the fall of Soviet Union. He failed on a number of fronts. One of them was external. The satellite states of the USSR, as the USSR was collapsing, whose Western democracy as their leadership, and that was never meant to happen. John Paul II was almost as much against democracy as he was against communism. And he was vocal about that. What they were supposed to choose was the authority of the papacy. After this history in 1991, he becomes so angry that when he visits Eastern Europe in this history after 1989, that we don't hear much about uh, the, those visits. 
Before the fall of the Soviet Union, tens of thousands of people were would show up, and the vast majority of them never show up after the fall of the USSR. On the right slide. Should be. Okay. Should be the right one. The the reason they don't show up is because he has offered so many of them offended time after time. Oh, I'm sorry, offended. That's all right. <laughs> he he offered offense and offense and. Uh, the reason they didn't show up is because he has offended so many of them time after time. He is condemning them for their choices, for not listening to the authority of the Catholic Church, for choosing Western capitalism and democracy, for not sticking to the church teachings and for all their strong conservative issues. And this internal issue is directly uh, related to that. Because John Paul II is a strong conservative, he believes in traditional teachings of the Catholic Church that it, that it has held for over thousands, a thousand years and he is directly opposed by the, by the Jesuits. So the Catholic Church is split on, on the inside. Hmm. In 1888, fail, it was split on, on the inside between Butler and Smith. Yeah. and the leadership who were holding to the traditional views of the church, and they were in opposition to this new light from Jones and Wagner on justification by faith. John Paul II is, is all about works, holding to those old Catholic ideas of birth control, the role of women, their priesthoods, all these different issues, and it, and in comes the Jesuits with radical new views. It's a split within the Catholic Church. Same thing. Here, down here. Mm. So this is the history from the beginning of modern Israel into their Omega history. This is the history of the beginning of modern Babylon. We can see them in the scattering time it's from 1798 to 1899. And they come out of the scattering into in 1899 with the rising up of Paselli. Right over here. Okay. Missing, I'm missing the G there. Whereabouts? Uh, in that 1899 to 1945, when they're in their gathering. Oh, yeah. Missing the G right there. All right, scattering here. This is G. Okay. And it's interesting to note as we're going to do the studies that we do tomorrow, is that looking at this, I think we've all seen this, that they're, they run right around 100 years um, separate from each other. That, you know, they're, the, the, the lines that are laid out, it shows that they're, um, they're 100 years I don't know, it's 100, we're 100 years behind them, 100 years. You know what I'm seeing? There's 100 years difference between um, the two until we get towards the end and we all meet together at the same time. 
coming into line at the same time. Yeah, very interesting. Okay. Um, can you pick the counterfeit? Seventeen. We have, yeah, we have seventeen ninety-eight. Rise of Miller, and that equals to eighteen ninety-nine. The rise of Paselli. Mm, yeah, right here. And we go to um, 1818, Miller's message. And then 1917, the message of Fatima. 1917. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. right in here, yeah. right here. No, the blue line takes you down there to 1818. Yeah. Yeah. From this one down to here. Right. And you got uh, 1844. You have uh, a disappointment. Disappointment. In the SDA or the Millerites. And uh, 1945, you have uh, Fatima disappointment. Right. Scattering. Right. Scattering. And then you have 46 years from 1798 to 1844 up on top. Mm -hmm. The 46. And then 46 years from 1899 to 1945. 1899. Yeah, on the bottom. Yeah, bottom. on the on modern Babylon. 1899 to 1945. Yeah, where Paselli is. To the left. Right next to you. I'm missing it. All the way over to the left. No. Oh, no, all 1899. The way. 1899. Yeah. Keep going. Right. Keep going. Underneath 1798. It's probably hitting me. Oh, oh, right here. Yeah, see the green? 46 years? Yeah. Yeah, 46 years. Mm -hmm. From 1899 to 1945. And then you got the, you got 1850, you have the charts, or the chart of 1850. Right here. And then uh, you have 1950. Is the dogma of assumption. Right. And they line up perfectly. Yep. Then you got uh, 1863, organization, organization. And, and rejection of the message. Right. Same thing. Then you have uh, 1962, uh, organization and rejection of their message. Yep, perfectly. Okay. Then you got 1881, the death of the leadership, uh, James White. Here. Yeah. And then uh, 1981, you have the assassination attempt on John Paul II and Ronald Reagan. Yeah, right down here. Right. And then you got uh, 1888, Jones and Wagner. Oops. Sorry. That's okay. 1888, you have Jones and Wagner, New Light versus Traditional Church Leadership. Right. Butler and Smith. Yeah, Butler and Smith. And in 1989, 
the Jesuits versus John Paul II. Wow. Beautiful details, but yeah. things that have happened in history. <laughs> wow. Okay, and uh, yeah. on the bottom we have the the Jesuits' radical new thoughts versus John Paul II traditional church teachings. Yeah, right here. It also says that the Jesuits new, the Jesuits radical new thoughts are really in regards. I'm sorry, I that is sensitive there. Let me go back. It says the Jesuits radical new thoughts are really in regards to our counterfeit of the righteousness by faith. Yeah, that's a cool one right there. That's a cool chart. Yeah, very good. Radical New Thoughts, B.S. John Paul, second traditional church teaching. Yep. Jesuits represent radical new thoughts are really in regard to our counterfeit of righteousness by faith. Yeah. Wagner and Jones. I'm going to autocorrect on that. And beneath it's supposed to be two assassination attempts. What was that? I didn't hear you. Underneath 1981, it's supposed to say two assassination attempts. Oh. Autocorrect must have handled that for me or something. Oh, right here. Uh -oh. Yeah, this is two assign. Oh, the misspelling here you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. Can I make a comment? Sure. I just I just looked up a list of papal bulls, and uh, this is amazing. So, you know how we have um, the on on our line right, nineteen stars was nineteen eighty nine, and uh, Elder Jeff Pippinger, right, and uh, John, and in the, so in this list of papal bulls, nineteen ninety eight shows up this incarnation, incarnationis mysterium, the mystery of incarnation by John Paul II. And, um, and it is, um, what is it called? Let me just quickly. It is uh, basically in, in diction of, of the great jubilee of, of year 2000. And this is right before 9-11. So amazing that that they even, you know, Satan is even copying, um, getting close, copying uh, our line, you know, the modern, uh, not modern, um, uh, the, the last church. Um, and- uh, and Counterfeit. Paul, yes. And John Paul II is, uh, Parallels with uh, Elder Jeff Pittenger, right? And uh, and he has a pa paper in 1996, time of the end. And uh, John Paul II has a paper too, the mystery of the incarnation. And um, that's really amazing. And then when Pope Francis comes, he also makes a bull. And this bull in 2015 is the face of mercy. And... Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, the indiction of, a, of which is the indiction, uh, indiction of a holy year, the extraordinary jubilee of mercy of 2015, 2016. And he had this door, door of mercy. If you remember, he had this uh, ceremony where he opens the door, right? This is so, I, the counterfeit is so, um, you know, we don't, we, we sit in our, you know, shut out from the world and uh, the world doesn't, you know, the world can't experience, can't see the, the beautiful things that is happening here, right, internally. But, but you can see on the counterfeit, on the counterfeit, they are doing it on a, I mean, you can actually see how beautiful, the beautiful things that is going on 
uh, within our movement, not just in our movement, just the, the beauty of the movement, of this movement, you know, that is by looking at the counterfeit, because when 19, in 1996, when this, when the time of the end magazine comes up, you don't see the, the, uh, that it's actually something really great and not right away, not in 96, not in even, you know, in 2000. So it takes a long time, even all mm -hmm. the way until midnight cry to realize the importance, not, not the midnight cry, but, you know, the, uh, Elder Paminder, uh, you know, he, he understood the importance of it right way before, of course, but I mean, for the movement, for the commonplace, um, um, member of the movement to realize how important Time of the End magazine was, the two stream of, of information in that paper. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, this is so amazing. The, you can see how the beautiful thing that is going on um, on this earth, which is this movement. And, uh, yeah. but you can't see it physically. You can, but you, I mean, not us, but you know, outsider cannot see it. But by looking at the counterfeit, you can, I mean, us, we can see how beautiful, that there's beautiful, wonderful things happening. Yeah. Yes. It's all looking back into history and, and both of this uh, modern Israel and, and of course, modern Babylon. Yeah, there's a history there. And to compare those. It just opens up so much, so much more. Yeah, it's prophecy. Thank for, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Sister Lana. Well said. No problem. Yes, very good. So I think we have a few more. Okay. A few more pages, maybe more. What? Um, when... When we come to our reform line, then the history of the papacy becomes much more detailed because they are having the same troubles, same trouble as we are having. Satan counterfeits Christ's work with his, with his church and then repeats the same thing with his, his own church Hence, we have the history of 1899 through 1949. 45. Uh, I mean, 1945, with the, the two world wars and the counterfeiting the first and the second angel's message, messages. Yeah. Ellen White here. Yeah. And that's Lucia. Lucia, I think that's how you pronounce it. So in those two 46-year periods, the Alpha of Modern Israel and then the Alpha of Modern Babylon, you have those mm -hmm. two periods. You have the first and second angel's message. Yeah. Mm. Oh, this one has a quiz. Yeah. Why did the papacy go into captivity? Oh, the answers are already spilled out on you. Wow, uh, you're not supposed to close your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I didn't have the slide set up to do it right. <laughs> uh, they they it should be, I guess it should say they rebelled against their boss. Against their boss. Satan failed to do their job function. Their boss is Satan, and they failed to do their job function. Right. Yep. Their boss. Oh, their boss. Is that the same? Yeah. Yeah, it's that's the same, same slide. One. I think that's, uh, that must be the end. Oh, that's a simple one. Okay. When did the papacy go into? Captivity. And that's 1798. Yeah, that date should stick very firmly in our mind. Mm -hmm. A lot is connected to it.
What brought the? Go ahead. You can read it. What What brought the papacy out of captivity? It was a three step message. Fatima. Uh, first message: fear. Second, King of the South. And the third, judgment. Yeah. I think that's the last one. Yeah, that is the last one. Oh, very nice. Thank you, Brother Francisco, for reading. And well, thank Mona, you for putting up with me. Oh, very good. Yeah. We're sharing it. Any comments? Yeah. Yeah, I want to make a quick comment on um, because Brother Troy put a comment in here. And uh, you read it. But I believe Satan knows the reform lines as well so he knew once 1989 was given as the time of the end this will be a repeat of the end of ancient israel therefore he was able to catch up with the movement he knows we are repeating christ's dis dispensation so i wanted to just point out from what i remember is that um he did not know if you for those that were here in when 2016 when we came to understand that the king of the south um, does come back that he didn't know that either. I, I remember that being taught. Does anybody else remember that? That he actually learns by watching us. Yeah, I remember Elder Tess saying that in that, uh, I think it's in the presentation in 2019 even, that, um, you know, he learned Satan, Satan was, had to learn it from us about the, um, you know, uh, King of the South to catch up, and uh, yeah, so I, I'm not exactly sure when was the first time it was said, but I I just remembered that Elder Tess was saying about that too. Yeah, I think it was 2016. I might have the year wrong, but I think it was 2016 in Holland. The one, the messages in Holland, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. If somebody remembers that, but I'm pretty sure it was. Another good review. That's a good review. And it's good timing too, because it it um, you know you're gonna do in God we trust tomorrow, and then I'm gonna do the three structures, and the three structures, you know, this is one of those structures, the counterfeit. You got modern Israel being one of them, and then um, the counterfeit, and then in God we trust being the third structure. Yeah, it does uh, reference too. Um, what in God we trust, the Acts 27, towards the end of it, on the second one. It, yeah, it really gives a good, um, uh, yeah, it just brings out more about how it all fits together on the line. And with the shipwreck with uh, the SDA church and uh, the United States. That kind of brings to our memory, look where we are now today. So if, is there any more comments or questions? We just, go ahead. Uh, we just, I uh, uh, guess we are coming to understand that <clears throat> That they, um, not that we are coming to understanding. Satan is coming to understand, uh, not coming. He is coming in, 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 um, in strand. Uh, sorry, I forgot the word. Mm -hmm. In step with us, he's now. It's amazing that the idea that he's actually has to learn stuff from us. And that really confirms that uh, the angels don't know uh, the, um, sorry. <laughs> I know, I get those blocks a little bit here and there. Yeah, but what, what I'm trying to say is that so, then then he attends our meetings, he, he attends each of us, well, he, since there's so little of us, he, may um you know be monitoring us each one of us to um you know imagine the attack 
because there's so little of us, the attack that we um, that we are actually experiencing, uh, you know, spiritual attack, and how much we have to resist temptation. Um, you know, each one of us has our own struggles, right? And uh, so, mm-hmm. so so much so much more we need to, you know, understand the nature of man. Study where where we have to you know, come to terms of who we are and, and, and how much we can do, that, that it's really up to us to choose to go or to stay, you know. Yes. Well, his was, servants are on uh, our track every moment. I mean, the, the evil angels. So I was talking about today, I was catching up on the Brazil ones and it must be infuriating for him the closer we get to what really happened in heaven between him. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's so true, Adriana. I mean, yeah, we're going to... Yeah, go no, I'm... Because I'm, he knows his time is short, and, you know, it's yeah, short for us. Not. We don't even realize how short it is. He's, he sees this and knows that, you know, he only has a little time left. Yeah, and it's not just that, it's we're we're uncovering all the things that he's been doing secretly behind mm-hmm. the scene and it blew my mind today with which we kind of knew because of the ellen white quotes and i think we've talked about it in this group but you know the gender of god thing and the the angels how they don't really have a gender in heaven but when he came down here he knew to use this little thing against us this thing that we had that God gave us as a gift to be like him, to be able to create, he, he wanted to destroy and manipulate that, I guess, out of jealousy, because he couldn't make anything. So that's why he does everything as a counterfeit. But it's just the, yeah. the, the amount of layers to all of it is incredible. Yeah. How far did you get today? I'm almost that. done with the last one of Elder Tess, and then I'm going to go back around and do Elder Parminder's. Wow, okay. That's the, I decided to go that way because I wanted to get one string of thoughts done, and then I'll do the other. Well, they kind of, they overlapped quite a bit, too, but you I know, I know. So we'll see how that goes, but I still want, there's some of them, and I have to watch multiple times because there's just a lot in there I'm going to get, but. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> They're so good. It's so good. Such a blessing. It is very much. Thanks for those comments. Yeah, I think we missed a slide here, didn't we? But yeah, there was a few in this quiz. Yeah. The answers were showing anyway, so that kind of blew it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We can contemplate this. Was 1989 success or failure? What did John Paul II want? He wanted more than the fall of the Soviet Union. He failed on a number of fronts. One of them was external, the satellite states of the Soviet Union as the Soviet Union was collapsing, chose Western democracy as their leadership and that was never meant to happen. Mm, Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that was the last one we read. Francisco read that one. Yeah. I was going to say something in connection with uh, what Sister Lana said, and of course, with our study of counterfeit. Um, Many times it was said in the SDA that Satan is an intelligent being and he's studying the prophecies. Uh, He might do that, I don't know. But the thing is that he has to listen to what we are doing. He has to see what we are doing because all this information comes under inspiration and he has no inspiration. He, he has to learn from us, from our studies and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, something Brother Troy pointed out in the chat and because I was thinking the same thing that um, when it comes to comparing to ancient Israel, that he was there. He knew that history. 
You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. If he knew that yeah. he knows that history because he was there, we weren't. Yeah. Beautiful message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. What was that? I didn't hear you. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Oh, me too. Yes. I sent out the schedule too. I think I got it right because I didn't have. I try to keep the the separate the the different schedules that we go by depending on when um, Elder Carmander is there and and you know how we mix mix it up sometimes. But I think I got the schedule um, right. If I, I I'm pretty sure it was right in the email. So. Yes, I got that. No, I didn't get it uh, for tomorrow. I got, of course, this one for uh, tonight. Well, thank but, you. Yeah, I'm. It's probably there on my email, but yeah, I have to go through it and see. And brother Francisco, thank you too for. Yes. Thank you so much of it. I appreciate your sharing with reading, brother Francisco. But, yeah, that was not nice. a problem. Yes. Not a problem. Was, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, not a problem. Yes, very good. So we still have, we have a little bit of time, but you know, we we're going to make it till eight. Well, we can, um, I don't want to open up and start reading anything, but just discuss a little bit about, um, how, how we're coming along in the A.T. Jones document and what we're learning in there. Because I'm just thinking about that as I, I just finished before we started here tonight, the transcribing of the next, not, not my study for tomorrow, but the next one I'll be working on, one of them. And, um, you know, it's just interesting because it's a review one. It was uh, Germany, I think it was. And, uh, and just the need to understand um, a lot of the A.T. Jones writings. So good direction to have gone in, in the document that we chose so far. So keep that in mind as we can have you know, stuff where we need to fill in, um, start looking through some of the um, writings of A.T. Jones to what we ought to move on to next. Because we'll probably be done with that in two more um, studies, I think. Didn't we talk about that, Sister Christine? I think we'll be done with it in like two more studies. Yes, two, two more studies sounds about right. Yeah, and so then we might want to have something else um, considered lined up. But we could always um, just have prayer and close a little early if anybody wants to, or if you have anything to discuss. Um, if you want to pull up the schedule, we can do that, but let's pray first if we're going to do that. Okay. Yeah. Sister Jackie, do you want to close in prayer? Sure. I'd be happy to. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your guidance, your, your wisdom. And what you've given us as we review these studies, these lines from the past, a little over a year and a half ago. And yet there's so much to learn, to look at what you've given us in the past and how it relates now to the time we're living in. We thank you for the leadership for your elders, who are dedicated, dedicated in their hearts and minds as your servants to give us and share with us this beautiful light. And we're thankful, Father, for one another because as we come together, especially on this Sabbath night, that we learn from one another and that we share with one another. And yes, things become more revelant to us. 
So we know that you're guiding, you're guiding each and every one of us step by step, no matter where we are and living this truth on the lines. We know that Satan is a defeated foe. We have nothing to fear for the future because of what you've laid out before us from the past. It gives us much faith, much trust in you that we continue on the journey. And we know that time is short and we wanna use every moment and all of our resources, talents that you have given us to be able to serve our fellow human beings, especially the Levites. But this message that you've given to us and we're so grateful that you have brought us together as a movement of people, as a body of people from all different walks of life. And whatever we learned in the past that we can know that we didn't know really anything until we came into this message and this movement. So we're very grateful and we just wanna give you all the praise and all the glory. And we thank you. We thank you for hearing our prayers and answering, giving us strength every day to go forward, no matter how old we are, what age we are, and what our experiences are. We know that, that you are upholding us. If we do our part and trust you, that you will lead us off. You will lead us in the way of victory. And we thank you for this. Bless each one of us tonight as we go into the Sabbath hours tomorrow. And we thank you for all that you do, for your great love and mercy for each one of us and for this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.